and yeah, Weishan, thanks for uh, getting in touch with me. Thank you for hosting. Uh, thank you, everyone at Adobe, for hosting as well. Uh, great campus, um, and I'm very excited to be here and talk about Orbital Insight, especially around the humanitarian efforts that we do. Um, I was chatting with people beforehand, so there's a lot that Orbital Insight does. Uh, but for this meetup, I will, I'll focus on these, but happy to have it. always chat about what I do and the company uh, afterwards or at a future date. So thanks for the introduction. Um, I think Weishan got most of it. I'll just do another overview. So uh, I graduated from Washington University in St. Louis in 2011, where I worked on computer vision machine learning. At that time, after graduation, I did go to A9, which is actually an Amazon subsidiary in Palo Alto. Uh, it was a really exciting team for me because at the time, more smartphones were coming out. And I was really excited about the concept of you know, building products that people could just take something out of their pocket and then using computer vision and machine learning actually uh, make use out of uh, those techniques. So I joined the visual search team for Amazon, which was focusing on yeah, exactly what I was talking about, of take your camera phone and point it at the world around you and recognize, for the most part, Amazon products. Uh, so we had capabilities that were really good at matching things like books and movie covers because they had very distinct cover art and they were sort of rigid objects. And then also at that time, there was a big initiative in Amazon to work on not just products related stuff, but Amazon was building, if any of you remember, the uh, Fire phone. Didn't do so well. I see a few nods. <laughs> One of the really exciting things for that phone was that it had a button, which was called, uh, I think, I forget what the button was called, but then it would pop up this app called Firefly. And so that used the camera to recognize things around the world. And so our team was pretty pivotal for recognizing products, but also using OCR, optical character recognition, to recognize phone numbers and emails and URLs that you might see either on business cards or storefronts. And then in 2014, one of the big projects I worked on was gift card scanning. <coughs> it was pretty lucky for me to be at A9 at that time, because around that time, 2013, 2014, uh, deep learning became even more used, and I, we were we were lucky enough at A9 to actually sponsor the Berkeley Group for CAFE in terms of uh, being early adopters of the CAFE library, using it at our company, and also getting to interact with some of the, the both professors and students at Berkeley on, on CAFE. So yeah, deep learning became really uh, widely used in Amazon at the time. Gift card scanning uh, uses deep learning. It was pretty interesting because we did the training offline, but then to actually run it on the device. You know, nowadays with TensorFlow and other libraries, it's really easy to run things on mobile. But at the time, using Cafe, not not simple, not easy, especially like you could hack it, but to get that in an Amazon app at scale to go through all of, you know the code reviews and everything, it would have been a big challenge. So we actually rewrote the forward pass of the code to be able to run some of the deep learning models for gift card scanning. And that was one of the, the first uh, deep learning computer vision CNN feature for Amazon. So then uh, in 2015, I joined Orbital Insight, which I'll be talking about more in depth today. And yeah, I was telling people uh, earlier that it's kind of a scary jump for me. We were about 15 people at the time in 2015. Uh, we've gone through two um, <clears throat> fundraising rounds since I've joined, and now we're about 130 people, which is exciting in itself, and we're continuing to grow. And uh, yeah, for me, the reason I jumped was that there's there was just uh, with satellite imagery, there's so many there's so many products that you can build. There's so many different applications that uh, using computer vision and machine learning really made sense to me. In terms of uh, you know, I really like deep learning and wanted to get even more experience and more to do more applications. And to me, satellite imagery was sort of like an untapped market in terms of a lot of data with uh, a need for machine learning. So I quickly want to go over what our company does at a high level and talk about uh, what we do in the computer vision machine learning team. And then after that, I'll, I'll talk mostly about applications for humanitarian efforts. But at a high level, we use things like computer vision and data science to take lots of imagery and lots of data and understand what's going on in the world and build products that actually are useful to a lot of different customers. So why are we around? Why is this a company? Because the things that we do aren't necessarily new like they're not new topics like satellite imagery isn't new it's been around for decades um, machine learning not necessarily new but i think there are three pillars that really drove why orbital insight as a company makes sense now 
So the first one would be the commercialization of space. Thanks to companies like SpaceX, it's a lot easier to launch things into space. So what's happening uh, is that there are more satellites. There are more companies that are launching more satellites. And so there was a lot of data beforehand, and now there is, continues to be this uh, exponential growth in just the raw data. And then on the cloud computing side, uh, that's always been around, but especially now with deep learning and GPUs, uh, it's getting even, even larger. And then also on the algorithm side, so data analysis for satellite imagery, it's not really a new thing, and I'll talk today about how there have been other techniques, but using deep learning is great because it actually gets you uh, state-of-the-art results that are really making leaps beyond what was possible uh, even a few years ago in this space. So at a high level, we as a company have this huge funnel of data, which is mostly around imagery. I, I usually say satellite imagery, although we do work with other providers that have uh, aerial imagery or images from drones. Just imagine that there's this huge funnel of data that's sort of in its raw form, it's just images. And so if customers, if people you know, downstream did want to understand things that is in this data, it would take a pretty large workforce to just have humans analyze and look at all of these images. So the point of Orbital Insight is that using automation, using deep learning um, and computer vision, we can automate so much of this and come out with different data products and data feeds that are useful to a lot of different customers. So some of those customers uh, we have include financial analysts that want to have uh, insights into different markets and be able to act on that. Um, we do work with different government as well in terms of um, not at a high level looking at macro trends for uh, different people in that space. And then today I'll be talking about nonprofit and humanitarian efforts. But um, I guess the interesting thing there is that a lot of what we do, like the packages that we build, the products that we build, and the way we package the data is very useful for a lot of different sectors, not just, you know, just for financial, just for government, but they actually want a lot of the same answers in terms of like retail trends of how people are shopping around the world can be useful to a lot of different uh, uh, customers. Okay, so I myself didn't really know much about satellite imagery, and I'm guessing not many people in this room uh, do as well. So I want to give you sort of an insight into what it actually looks like, how much is there, because it's pretty interesting. Uh, I usually get people on very broad extremes just on the question of how many satellites are there, how many uh, observations are there. You get people that kind of assume uh, more like Big Brother-esque of there are super high resolution satellites that anytime you like walk outside, they'll have a picture of you or maybe even a video. Uh, I think that's a pretty gross overestimation. Uh, but at the same side, there are people who think there's really not that much imagery available whatsoever, or that it's not very frequent. Um, if I had to err on one of those two, probably the second. But uh, uh, here, I'll show you more some of the images. Uh, so the first thing to notice is that the images come in lots of different resolutions. On the far left, that's an image from Landsat. Landsat is a satellite that's owned and operated by the US government. And they freely release their data. And it's lower resolution. Each pixel is about 15 to 30 uh, meters per pixel. And it also has, actually, it's also in this fourth panel here. Landsat also has multispectral bands. So this is showing one of the infrared bands. And so the Landsat uh, satellites are really good for wide area analysis, things like crops or yeah, looking at land at like a very broad kind of sense. On the far left, that's kind of what you can see there. And then the second panel shows, that's actually a newer company, it's called Planet. They're based in San Francisco and they launched these satellites that are about this big, they're called CubeSats. And they're decent resolution, like they're better than Landsat, but not necessarily as good as the uh, high, highest resolution. But what's really good about this company is that because the, they have smaller satellites, they can launch a lot more. So you get a lot of data from that company, and you can get very high, uh, what we call revis revis rates for for that type of imagery. Um, that type of imagery, you can kind of see roads and buildings, uh, but you can't necessarily see things like cars or other vehicles. Whereas in the third panel, that's where you can start seeing objects like cars and more fine-grained detail about buildings. Um, and then the last panel, uh, this is pretty interesting. So this is not optical imagery. Like all the other ones are optical, meaning like the sun sends out energy and we're getting the response of light. Over here, this is a satellite called Synthetic Aperture Radar, or SAR. My colleague is in the audience who uh, 
uh, did her PhD in SAR and who is, is our in-house expert for working with SAR. Um, and so it's, it's really cool source because uh, you send out an active signal and you get a response. And what's good about that is that uh, it can actually, a lot of the other optical ones, a big issue is clouds. There's a lot of clouds at any given time on the Earth. SAR actually can send a signal and, and get a response through the clouds. And you'll see that actually comes up in one of the applications that I talk about today. Uh, the other reason why this is shown as an animation is because everything we do is not necessarily just about, here's a snapshot. We want to understand what's going on in this picture. But we have, want to look at the temporal component. We want to look at trends over time. And that's true for the applications today that I'll talk about and um, other ones that, I want, that uh, we don't have time for. On the machine learning side and AI side, these are sort of the categories of tasks that we work on. It's pretty standard for the computer vision um, community. So things like image classification, we have a few of those. Uh, we mostly use those for tasks uh, that help us filter out uh, images. So things like, hey, we have this huge image. Is it cloudy, yes or no? If it's cloudy, maybe we're just going to throw it out because there's no point in running object detectors when there's just going to be a big cloud. And then on the other side, we have semantic segmentation, which is the task is given an image, classify each pixel that belongs to a semantic class. That's for us really good for things like uh, what we call land cover and land use, where it's detect all the roads, all the buildings, forests, different land types. And then a lot of what we do uh, revolves around object detection. And that's the, the category is given an image, uh, locate objects, and also maybe classify them if there's multiple classes. And uh, what's shown here is that usually in computer vision, you might see often the middle one, the bounding boxes. That's a common task. Uh, but for us, sometimes it's OK to characterize an object with just a single point. Uh, so in this case, these are just small cars, which there's not really much size information, or the size information is roughly the same. Uh, so a point kind of does OK in that case. And then for other customers, you might actually want to characterize more information than just about box, like the, uh, the, the segmentation mask or the polygon. So that's on the right. Uh, it's hard to see. This is showing classifications of different housing types for, for um, some of the products that we've built. And to summarize, yeah, the, what my group does is we build lots of different algorithms, uh, tasks that I just showed. And this is sort of the tip of the iceberg of the things that we build, things around object detection, ships, trucks, airplanes, and things around uh, things like land use, uh, whether it's forest, water. And you can imagine that. Uh, we can sort of slice and dice those in many different ways for many different customer needs. This slide showcases that uh, I kind of want to talk about why I joined Orbital Insight. So before deep learning, there's uh, oftentimes in the room, what's called the remote sensing community, a lot of the algorithms that people would build would usually look something like you look at a pixel and you want to look at multispectral bands. And it was, oh, let's compare the red band against the near infrared red band. And let's look at the, the response of that. And people even had uh, these, what they called like code books or databases of this is what you know, water looks like depending on these different, these are the responses of water in these different satellites. This is the response of uh, maybe like metal roofs. And so the big downfall for there, for, for algorithms like that, um, I think the first one that I pointed out was spatial context, if you're just looking at a single pixel, it's pretty hard to, just given that amount of information, to tell, is this a building, is this a road? Because you don't really have like the context of what's around it, or what does it look like? Imagine if you took your eyeball and you just zoomed in on a single pixel, like you couldn't really make that decision. Uh, the other part is that it requires multispectral bands in some cases, um, which for some things, like we still need to use multispectral bands. And I'll, I'll, I think I will bring that up in this, in this talk. Uh, but if I go back to, you know, even one of these these uh, images, like things like airplanes, like a human doesn't need uh, that many that, like extra bands to be able to say, hey, that's an airplane. In fact, you don't even really need color in this case. You could probably just do it in grayscale. So yeah, some of these systems that you know required multispectral bands didn't have spatial context, and they also end up coming up with very complex systems. So this is like a flowchart that describes a system to do uh, cloud detection. Um, I also kind of like showing this one because it's pretty interesting that you know I talk about back in the day remote sensing. This one's actually from 2012. Uh, but the good news is, to be honest, that uh, it's not just Orbital Insight, but there's other companies and also in academia. People now have basically said, yeah, like 
to do the best in remote sensing, we should look into newer age computer vision and machine learning models. Uh, so it is sort of a good story now that uh, people have sort of come to reason that, yeah, uh, more deep learning kind of gets you better results. So yeah, deep learning, the advantages are that you have spatial context, in some cases, lots of spatial context. Uh, you can usually train things end to end, so you don't need these complex flowcharts about how do I detect clouds or water. Uh, you can just sort of feed in data and then your network problem with the task that you're trying to do. Um, but I think what's most important is making sure that you have state-to-date results. So it's not just, hey, we have simpler engineering systems, but it's actually getting better results than some of the other methods. And this is uh, one of the first semantic segmentation deep learning models, which was the, what's called FCN, the Fully Convolutional Networks, uh, from back in 2015. But even in the deep learning community, we've, we've come a long way since then. Okay, so that was the background of our company and some of the things that we do. Uh, so the rest of the talk, talk about different uh, applications. So the first one is around disaster relief. A colleague actually just pointed to, uh, found this the other day and pointed it to me that there's actually this international charter for international charter space and major disasters. Uh, this is pretty interesting because I didn't know about this. So uh, at Orbital Insight, we actually have the luxury of, we work with a lot of different satellite providers. And so we have a lot of imagery at our disposal, but a lot of other people in the world don't have imagery. Like some of it is free, like things like Landsat. Uh, but otherwise, a lot of the commercial satellites, the data is really expensive to actually buy. And so what this charter does is allows people, allows companies to freely provide their data, especially when it's around different disasters, and people can go there and actually get the data. And this, this slide uh, is pretty good to show a lot of the different disasters where satellite imagery could be impactful. Um, the disclaimer I do definitely want to make about these different types of disasters and how satellite imagery plays is, is basically that uh, a lot of these disasters definitely cause a lot of pain and there's a lot of uh, commotion that goes down on the ground. And so by no means am I saying like, hey, there's a disaster, like satellite imagery is the first thing you should do or it's going to be the most impactful. Uh, but just because we work in the satellite imagery space, I, you know, I, I do believe that it can be impactful. And sometimes people that are on the grounds making decision aren't even aware that the data from satellites could be useful or that it could be um, analyzed in a way that, that um, would be of use. Um, for instance, like if you're looking at earthquakes, you might need to really sort of dig deep in the imagery. It's not very obvious as to where it's impacted. Or today I'll be talking about floods and fires. Um, again, it's like just giving someone an image may not actually be as useful as actually doing analytics on top of it and then giving the derived analytics to people on the ground. Okay, so talking about flood analysis. So flood analysis is uh, pretty interesting because when a flood is going on, uh, there's usually a lot of clouds. And so optical images uh, can be pretty good at detecting water, but there will be a lot of times where you're not even gonna get an image of the ground just because it's gonna be covered with a lot of clouds. Uh, so that's where SAR really comes in and, and plays a big role. So SAR can actively uh, sort of see through the clouds or get data below the clouds. But for us, uh, data is data, and we usually like to get as much data as possible. So our solutions around floods uh, combine both, combine both optical and SAR and other information that I'll talk about as well. So that's really, uh, instead of just looking at the images and trying to make a decision or just looking at one provider, um, that is sort of one of the theses of our company of, uh, it's about combining multiple sources together and, and making data um, decisions based on that. So this is a little lesson about, um, I guess, pre-deep learning. So pre-deep learning, I think, um, a common calculation that people would do is called normalized uh, NDWI, which is normalized difference water index. And there's also NDVI, which is for vegetation, which sounds pretty complicated, but it's a very simple calculation where you just take, for each pixel, you take the green value, you subtract the, in this case, near infrared value, and then you divide by the sum of those. And what people have shown historically is that if you just do that calculation, so here's like an example image, uh, which I believe is some water source in the middle. If you do that calculation and you just look at the, the um, output of that function, you get a pretty strong response uh, for differences between things like man-made objects versus water versus uh, vegetation. And so we have used this before, but this is a common approach for detecting water of 
you just take an image, you calculate the NDWI, and you just threshold at some value and say, hey, everything below this, we'll consider that water. Um, so we, we have used this, but we've also uh, done deep learning where if you actually have data of where is the water, you can actually train models that uh, can just output where the water is. And NDWI honestly does a pretty good job for large body of water and um, like on average it does pretty well, but there's like some edge cases, maybe the image is a little characteristically off, like maybe it's a little hazy or foggy or um, maybe like the boundaries of the water with the land aren't necessarily that great. Uh, so we found that for the most part, uh, for water detection, deep learning is also doing a little bit better. Although some people might call it a little bit of an overkill because the NDWI is pretty, is very easy and, and, and uh, does recently well, uh, reasonably well. So for floods, uh, we've looked at actually a lot of floods around the world. This is just showcasing the work we did for Hurricane Harvey, which was in Houston. And this output actually shows, well, it's showing two things. It's showing the, this is a SAR image. And so what we do for these products is we look at the before and the after. So we want to be able to get imagery before the event occurred and then also the after. So the areas highlighted here are actually the difference. So these are the areas that uh, were essentially what we detected as flood. As you can see, this other area is obviously water. But we're detecting which areas are, are, are have become flooded after the event. And this is just looking at the uh, extent, so which regions are, are affected. Uh, what you can also do is look at the, or try to calculate the depth. And so to do, the, to do that, what, what uh, data is available is that there's digital elevation maps, or what are called DEMs. I think that's like slide out of timer on it or something. Uh, so the, the digital elevation map has like a 2D surface of the elevation of land. And so if you combine the extent of the flood with the elevation map, <laughs> Uh, you can get the, the you can see that the, the darker here is the the deeper the, the floods go, and so some people care about the extents, but some people also care about how deep it is because that uh, a difference between uh, you know a flood of a few feet versus more feet could affect more houses uh, or more more people more areas. Um, so yeah, on the flood side, uh, it is pretty useful for actual customers that we have around insurance, but it's also um, useful, like we actually provided people during Hurricane Harvey with that data and they were able to like find new areas that they weren't sure if they were flooded or not. Uh, so like I said earlier, it may not be able to tell you where you need to go first and impact certain people, but it can give you a very wide overview of extent. It's data that's, that, you know, we can provide to these people that, uh, that, you know, on the ground, they're not gonna do, they're not gonna all of a sudden like do satellite image analysis on their own. Uh, but also, even for our customers where we sell this to insurance companies, it's been pretty impactful in terms of um, just having more information for everyone involved in terms of, you know, the insurance companies, yeah, they want good data, but uh, we had one customer note where an insurance customer in um, Japan was actually able to preemptively contact their customers that have their insurance and say, hey, based on over on-site data, we know you're flooded. And the customers were like so shocked and like, wow, this is amazing. Because usually, usually you think of like the story of, hey, a disaster just happened. Now I have to go and I have to prove to my insurance company that you know I am affected by this. And the insurance company might take a while, but this was like very immediate response and just more information is being really uh, impactful for a lot of these disasters. Switching over to wildfire, um, looking at this is the this is actually wildfires in Napa about a year and a half ago. And years ago, year and a half. And so the what we did here, we actually did a few things around the space. We even looked at like car counts to try to see where certain areas affected just by trying to count the cars. Maybe people left all their car or uh, deserted those areas and drove out all their cars. Maybe those areas were more impacted. Uh, but this one is looking at just trying to understand where did the fires actually impact houses. Because if you heard on the news, it wasn't really obvious as to like which areas got cleared out. Like people uh, would evacuate, would, would be told to evacuate the, the areas, and then they might not even know if their house is affected or not. And you can see like even some houses that are right next to a house that completely burned down, some houses still uh, stuck around. And so, oh yeah, so what I'm trying here is that there's, we can look at both medium resolution, which gives you 
um, a wider extent and also more revisits in terms of you can see more images. Uh, but we were also able to capture some areas in high resolution where we got a before and an after image. And um, so for this, we already have algorithms to do different land use detection and buildings. So you can see that the before and the after, our algorithms are pretty more, or a lot more confident with where the buildings are and they sort of get smoothed out afterwards. And if you do a difference map, we can say these areas we believe are affected in medium resolution. And then for high resolution, uh, you can essentially just uh, individualize, like look at which houses themselves are affected. So these are the before and after of certain regions. And uh, if you just take like a difference, you can be able to say, oh, these regions, these houses are, are um, we believe that they're uh, no longer standing. Um, so yeah, these are these are ways that uh, honestly, if you if you did follow the news, it was pretty shocking how like there's not really that much data. Like people don't know what areas are affected, um, and so being able to just again provide data when these disasters are going on can really impact uh, the lack of data that, that exists. And obviously, it's a time of crisis, and people are very worried about many different things. Uh, so this is trying to just give data to people that uh, would find it. Uh, in the least be useful. I'm not saying this should be like the go-to source for everything, but uh, it has been uh, definitely impactful for people um, during these disasters. Moving on to poverty surveys and estimation. Uh, so this is an interesting one for satellite imagery in terms of like what can you actually do with around you know estimating poverty and doing surveys for satellite uh, using satellite imagery. So the first question is like really what are these surveys or what goes on nowadays? What do these surveys do? What kind of data are they collecting? And um, it's pretty interesting. There's not really one way things are done. Uh, so this is sort of a very gross generalization. Uh, but often what happens is people want to collect data of certain regions. And so they send people out by foot to go out and collect data. And so if the the, the data can range from just direct observations of people are going out and saying, oh, here's the type of roads I'm observing, here's the type of material used for housing. Uh, a, a big question, which you'll uh, directly make the connection to satellite, satellite imagery, is here's the material of roof that's being used. Apparently, um, for a lot of countries, material of the roof is very indicative of either social status or, or wealth. Um, and they also might do questionnaires in terms of like actually ask people, like, how much do you make? or how many days or how many hours per day do you uh, get for yourself versus how many hours a day are you working? And uh, at a high level, these these the data that's collected is useful for mostly economic studies. And so it could range from <coughs> studies of small city areas to entire countries. Um, but I think what most people claim in these economic studies is that data is pretty expensive to collect and it's definitely not perfect in terms of you know sending out people on foot, you're not gonna be able to cover the uh, entire extent of what you uh, want to study. So you have to sort of sample the areas to send out people. Um, yeah. So, yeah, the challenges are essentially that uh, oftentimes the survey areas are large. So it's not a really, it's not, it's not a straightforward answer of where should I send people to actually collect the data. Um, obviously there's other challenges with like, if you're gonna do a questionnaire, what are the types of questions you should be asking? I know they fair questions and all that, but just the concept of, hey, I wanna send people out to collect some data, you have to sample your area, and that's that's a hard case to do in itself. And we've actually looked into, can we preemptively help the sampling method? Like, not completely replace people going on ground, but can we tell different characteristics of an area? Oh, we think these are more dense urban areas, this is more rural, here's where you should start sending people, just based on like running building algorithms. Uh, but yeah, the other piece is that it, it's uh, expensive. So in 2015, actually roughly around the time that I joined, we started work with the World Bank, who World Bank does a lot of, spends a lot of money on a lot of these economic studies. And one of the projects that we were working on with them was a little uh, straightforward, a little bit out of the box, was can we use orbital insight signals in a way that would actually be useful to either correlate with poverty or to be useful in some of these like higher level studies that they're doing. Uh, so our first project was looking at Sri Lanka, and we just gave them our signals of here's the car counts, and here's the car counts over time. 
Uh, we ran building detection algorithms, which were pretty crude and naive at the time, um, and also crop detection. And uh, the World Bank released a white paper and just sort of plugged these into their models. And they weren't necessarily able to find extremely strong correlations with everything, but they did find that with buildings, a lot of times building density was pretty indicative of poverty, like more densely building areas uh, for Sri Lanka uh, correlated poorly with, uh, or correlated with more poverty. So that was sort of uh, one of the first projects that we did. Uh, then we did some follow-on work looking then at New Mexico and looking at using satellite imagery, can we just predict poverty itself? If we have ground truth of previous studies of, of poverty um, in maybe some small areas, can we train a model that directly takes the satellite imagery and just predicts it itself? And then if you have that, you can do it on a large scale. So it was a pretty interesting project. Um, one very interesting thing about this was, you know, I talked about that data's a, data cleanliness is definitely a challenge, as many of you definitely know. And so I think during this project, one of the takeaways is that the data itself that we were training against was hard to, first of all, format in a way that we could, like, you know, take image and say, here's the, the poverty level. Uh, and it was also mixed. You would, we were trying to take multiple studies and combine different uh, poverty measures. And, like, it wasn't really comparing apples to apples. So that was a big challenge with this project. Um, but at the, end of the, at the end of the day, we actually did get a somewhat strongish correlation uh, just being able to predict poverty um, rates just from satellite imagery. So at this point, I'd like to definitely highlight uh, another group that's worked on this. So this uh, group at Stanford, the Sustainability and AI Lab, has done a lot of work around satellite imagery for things like poverty and sustainability um, and looking at things like crops. And so, yeah, we've talked with people from this group, um, including the first author on this paper, Neil Jean, and they've done some really amazing work and have released their data and run it even at larger scales. And they've looked at things like using night lights. Can you use night lights as an indicator of, uh, or something that correlates with wealth or doesn't have, um, if you don't have night lights, does that mean there's a more uh, impoverished area? Um, but yeah, so, you know, at this meetup, you know, it's great that AI has been able to work on some of these projects and continues to work with uh, groups like the World Bank, but definitely want to highlight that there's, you know, uh, groups in academia and at top universities like Stanford that are also looking into this, which is pretty incredible. So the last topic I want to talk about is detecting deforestation. This is uh, one of my favorite projects that I've worked on at the company. And uh, before getting into, like, the, the outputs and the machine learning parts, I want to sort of again, sort of teach you what this problem is about. Uh, so these are two articles that I found that came out past, I think, half a year. One talks about how there's uh, a lot of forest that's being lost at a very rapid rate. And there's another article that talks about, hey, there's a lot of trees, more so than uh, we had a long time ago. And so they sound like contradictory and like it couldn't really be possible. It's got to be one or the other. Um, but I actually did read these in, in depth, and um, they're, they're both right actually. And so, so what's going on? Why is there this like seemingly uh, different message being sent out by, by different articles? So um, it comes down to essentially like what really is a forest? There's different types of forests. Um, and even in the very high level classification of natural forests versus planted forests, there's even more subclassifications. Uh, but for today, just want to sort of talk about these two types, natural versus planted. So natural forest would be something like a rainforest that grows naturally. And um, that is uh, not grown by, by men uh, or, or by people. It's not, it's not grown. Uh, usually planted forests are actually more like agriculture. They're grown as crops and with the intention to eventually be harvested. So things like timber forests, which again, those aren't necessarily about things like we need timber for things like furniture. Um, and here I'm showing palm oil plantation forests. Um, but yeah, the, just, there's a distinction between these types of forests in terms of their use. Like, Natural forests um, are natural. They're not intended to be cut down. They have more biodiversity. They're usually thicker, have older trees, which are good for the environment, versus planted forests are more like uh, crops that are eventually meant to be harvested. Yeah, so hopefully you can see this. This is on the top is the natural forest, if it wasn't clear. And then on the bottom, these are palm oil plantations. And you can actually see the rows of crops, or the, the rows of the, the trees. And here's an, another in-depth uh, view into the palm oil trees. So what are they? Why do we care? Um, maybe some of you have heard about, oh, there's palm oil trees, and maybe it comes with a bad connotation. Um, 
I don't really want to make a judgment call on that per se, but just sort of like learning, uh, having you learn about what they actually look like. So palm oil trees are these big trees with big canopies, and they're not very dense forests. And these are the actual palm oil fruit. And uh, essentially what's going on is that uh, people have started using them a lot more in foods and um, products that you would find in the bathroom. So palm oil is very ubiquitous at this point. It's in, it's in so many products that we uh, use as humans. And because of that, there's more demand for it. So therefore, there are people who want to uh, make more money by uh, basically cutting down rainforests, planting these palm oil uh, crops, which can take roughly, I forget the exact numbers, uh, please don't quote me on it, I think three to 10 years to grow, and then they get harvested, and then the, the cycle goes over again. So if you look at forest cover in a very broad sense, just uh, this, this, what I'm showing here is, is um, Malaysia. And this is from another group, which is from the University of Maryland. And I think they've also done really amazing work uh, with remote sensing and in forests. They've really been able to build solutions that work at large scale and are able to answer questions of things like forest and different land cover across the entire world and look at changes over time. However, uh, they use Landsat. And at this point in time, I don't believe they use deep learning. Um, so they use more like statistical models of look at each pixel and over time, this is characteristic of forest or not. And so at that point, at that level, using that imagery and those methods, you're not really able to say different types of forests. So if you just look at all the different, all the pixels that are forest in Malaysia, it looks very green. It looks somewhat, I guess, healthy in the sense of there's a lot of forests. Um, however, not all of this is natural forest. A lot of it is palm oil. And so that was sort of the, the work that Orbital Insight did. We did this with a nonprofit called WRI, the World Resources Institute. And um, that was one of the main challenges for them. They have this data of forests, but it's not really broken down into natural versus planted forests. So what we did is we took imagery from Planet. So Planet is the startup that I talked about with the CubeSats. What's great about them, as I mentioned, was lots and lots of noise, and they have lots and lots of coverage. Um, because just like some of the things I showed earlier with floods and fires, there's going to be a lot of either smoke or clouds. Uh, the rainforest gets a lot of rain, and the rainforest has a lot of clouds. So you want to be able to take lots of images in the hopes of being able to have a cloud-free image where you can actually make analysis of the land. So this is roughly what the uh, land looks like. This is. Uh, potentially an easier use case where the gridded structures are very indicative of this is a palm oil plantation. But even if you kind of look the, the texture of the regions that are I'm not sure, but like these regions, you can actually, if you zoom in, you can kind of start seeing little rows versus something like right here, this is a little bit fluffier. It has the texture that's more indicative of the natural forest. So what we did was we trained, uh, we already have land use classifiers, but we trained um, an extra class that just says which areas are planted forest. And then we were able to run it at a large scale. Uh, we have our own processing systems. We have uh, the ability to detect clouds such that we throw out images that have clouds. And these are actually the results. So these are the results overlaying on high resolution, just so you can kind of see how it performs. So, on the top, we detected, hey, this is natural forest. And on the bottom, this is planet forest. Um, and you can see it in the high res, but we're actually running it on lower resolution imagery where it's a little harder to, to detect in that sense. Uh, but the really nice thing is that we can do that at scale. And so now uh, you get a better picture of not just what are the pixels or, or what are the areas that are forests, but break it down into natural forest versus planted forest. And if you compare that to the original image, you get a much clearer picture. Yes, there is a lot of forest, but you can start seeing some areas that um, have planted forest. And if you, so this group actually also does, uh, not just like, they do year over year, this is the forest cover, but they also do change. Um, and they also do, I believe, weekly change uh, alerts that say, oh, this area was forest, we think it got cut down. And so there's a lot of people that rely on that data and they say, oh no, this area of forest got cut down, I should go check it out. But like I said earlier, a lot of these areas that are planted forests, you would actually expect them at some point to be cut down, as opposed to you really want to be um, better about being able to monitor areas that are natural forests and see if those get cut down. There's, there's um, 
more impact in that sense. So this data that we have, uh, what's great is that you know people that want to make large scale analysis can look can zoom out and look at a large level what's going on. Uh, we also have very fine grained detail. If you zoom in, the amount of data that's there, you actually get very good details about roads and forests and where the cutoffs are. So people that uh, people in this space that want to know about forests, uh, sometimes you care about country level statistics or different boundaries of, of um, concessions, but sometimes you also want to care more about like the zoomed in level of what's going on at that granularity. And that's uh, also this is what this is showing. So protected regions are these are areas that um, you would expect or you, you hope that there are no planted forests there. For the most part, you see natural forests, although there's some areas that are starting to uh, planted forests are starting to encroach in there. Um, so this is the type of data that our customers can use can combine with other data sources that are telling them, hey, this is where force is being cut down, um, and they can actually make sort of informed decisions based on that. And uh, we too, we can do the, we do the temporal component, so not just looking at, hey, here's a static map of what, it, well, what uh, the land was like in 2017 or 2018, but we can actually uh, detect, in this case, it's a, a little bit more blatant example of, you see an image on the left that had natural forest in 2016, and then in 2017, it got cut down. We can detect that uh, fairly easily. You can even detect it on like a, a smaller scale as well. And so, yeah, the great thing about Overland Site is that uh, we too can run all these things at scale. So for the most part, a lot of the palm oil is planted around the the tropics. So these are the these are the countries that we've analyzed so far. And so, uh, yeah, it's a pretty massive amount of imagery, a massive amount of data. Um, kind of coming back to you know, the earlier things that I talked about, um, uh, it's impactful that to really do this analysis, you can't really have a human sit down and look at all of the images over time. That would just take way too much time. Uh, and with that, uh, I think that concludes what I have. So thank you, everyone. So anyone, we have five minutes located for Q&A. Yeah. Uh, what morning, what data are you Punching or what's like the smallest to the largest kind of volume of data? Yeah, so the question was what volume of data are you crunching? Uh, it really depends on the project. Um, I, yeah, it's definitely on the order of. Uh, actually, to think. So you just saw like the, the. You can think about it in square kilometers of land, which I think this is over uh, a few million square kilometers, if I'm getting that order correct. Uh, number of images that are Roughly something that could fit on a desktop is, is well into the millions. And then the yeah, number of uh, bytes is, I believe, into the petabytes at this point. And that's yeah. static image, not temporal progression of the, of the image. Uh, like, that's, that's like a snapshot? or is We that... analyze all the images. So even for uh, you, some of these things for... that I'm building, like, okay. like, like for so this is like 2017, but we actually uh -huh. analyzed all the images we got in 2017. Yeah. And then, like the big question, how much labeling did you need to do? Like, how, how did you do your labeling for this? Yeah, question of how we did our labeling. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, at a high level, like, like anything in machine learning, labeling is really key. Uh, so we do a lot of, we have a lot of expertise in-house for labeling, both in terms of the tools that we build and the uh, people that we sort of employ to do that labeling. Uh, because there's a lot of either metadata you could use for satellite imagery, like um, you could actually tell someone, hey, this is an image, here's where it is on the planet. You can actually point, here's the sun direction. So you're kind of like not understanding the scene. If you say, oh, the sun's over here, now the shadows make more sense. So we've built a lot of in-house tools that sort of do that. Uh, for this project in particular, were you wondering? Yeah, just um, Yeah, I forgot the numbers, but I believe it was, it was fairly large, I would say on the order of, 10 to 20,000 like, images that were hand labeled. Yeah. yeah. You talked about many great and impactful applications, right? But I'm curious, how, how do you come up, come up with these? Is this more of a platform of sorts where you expose multiple services and that folks can actually contact to, or is it more, you know, a client comes in with a need and then you build it and yeah. then you, you have the next client? Like, how, how, is, how is that thought process like? Yeah, great question. Um, the, I think both a blessing and a challenge is that our customers have different wants and needs. So we might have less technical customers that do want sort of everything built for them. 
uh, that maybe we need to do more from scratch if we haven't done it already versus other customers that maybe are more technical and we can provide them um, either what's called like shape files or, or just the trends of things over time. And so uh, there's a mix of, yeah, we have APIs, we have dashboards that people can log into. Uh, there's some custom or there's some packaged feeds that we sell to many people. And there's other times we have uh, both an internal and an external platform where people can say, oh, that's a really cool like algorithm that I want to run, but I want to run out of my AOI so they can log in they can create their shape file. They can run the analysis basically all themselves. Yeah. For the data, um, when there's a disaster and the revisit rates, um, like how frequently does data come in, or do they change how frequently they image areas that have disasters? Oh yeah, that's a good question. So the data rates around the disaster events. So some of the satellites are fixed, more or less, where they can kind of just like look down and take a picture. But some satellites are able to actually turn and point and shoot. Uh, so you will see that some of the providers that can do the latter will actually try to take more images, if possible, of the disaster areas. Uh, but from our side, the luxury that we have is that we work with many different providers. So not just waiting and hoping and praying that this provider gets a good image, but we can leverage all of them and try to get whatever image we can get across the board. So like for for North America, like urban areas, how often are they re-imaged or? Just for the- I'm just kind of curious like what the image rates are around the world. And yeah, that's a good question. I don't I think I- One or one every. Yeah, I think I alluded to some of that, but I didn't really talk about it in the slide. Um, so the high resolution satellites, there's on the order of 10. And so those, if you're trying to look at one particular area, well, you can probably get an image roughly every two weeks, depending on things like clouds, or they can actually turn in point. Um, but a lot of times those high resolution images will not take pictures of the rainforest because things aren't really changing. If they have an image from a year ago, it's probably okay. Um, but then for like this project, the planet satellites I was talking about, you should get an image roughly every two to three days, but then there still might be clouds. But that's, that's a pretty high revisit rate uh, in terms of satellite imagery. Yes. Yeah, I have a question about the data sources. When you do the training pattern, will you train each data source separately? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, do we train different data sources separately? Yeah. For the most part, yes, in terms of uh, sometimes they look similar, but it's not like if you imagine you're working on a computer vision problem where it's just give me cell phone cameras or maybe a DSLR camera image looks similar to a cell phone camera, especially now that the cell phone cameras are very good. But for us, a lot of times the images look characters, uh, much different characteristically in terms of uh, low resolution versus high resolution. There's some things that you just can't see, so there may not be that much to gain. Uh, but we have also done research for, if you're looking at things like land use, maybe it would be helpful to, even though like for this example, we got really high visit rates from the lower resolution satellites, if we have a, a high-res uh, satellite image, even if it's not up to date, even if it's from a few months ago, can we do uh, machine learning models that incorporate both of those sources? Uh, so we've looked into, into it a little bit. It's not a challenge in terms of building neural networks, like you just have different input paths. I think it's more of a challenge of when you create these pipelines that if you require high-resolution imagery, just making sure you keep track of all the bookkeeping of the images that you process. Yeah, good question. Yes. This might be a very basic question, but uh, in terms of regulation, you know, because you, you, you are targeting the whole world, so, you know, is it different, you know, country by country, or what is the legal guidelines that you have to follow? Yeah, what are the legal guidelines of satellite imagery? Uh, that's actually really interesting. So I alluded earlier to people who think, oh, it's Big Brother, and people, you can get a video of a human. Uh, the highest resolution satellite imagery, though, is the, the stuff that we do the car counting on. That's 30, the legal limit is 30 centimeters per pixel. That's uh, what's commercially available. Um, but then everything else is more or less below that. But yeah, you bring up a good point. There are different restrictions on different countries that have their own limits. But essentially what Orbital Insight operates on is we're operating on commercial satellite imagery that, uh, that anyone can sort of purchase. In, in, in the if you're flying over Russia or whatever, you know, the military installation site or whatever, you know, how would those work? Right? I don't, I don't know the characteristics of which countries and the limits and whatnot. Just yeah. an example, right? What's an example? Well, I mean, like oh. uh, recently, there are um, 
events in Myanmar, whatever, right? A lot of people are exiting the country, everything got burned down. So those would show up on satellite imagery, right? Yeah, I mean, so for us, we don't own or operate any satellites. So whatever we can get from the providers is there. I believe there might be either some areas that they just don't have pictures of, or they might actually like degrade the imagery, like downsample it, because yeah, if you blur it, there's not the, as much stuff that you can see. Thank you. Um, so uh, when a satellite is taking picture of, at different angles at different parts of the country, so how do you stitch data to get like one country? How do you stitch images? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good question. Um, so the how, how does the how does the satellite images get stitched? Yeah, yeah. There's actually a really interesting pipeline when it comes to the satellite providers of they acquire an image and how do they they, they do a bunch of different things. So the image itself may be looking not just straight down, but sort of what's called off nadar. And there's a process called, um, there's a, there's different processes for rectifying the imagery um, such that maybe warp it a little bit so it actually looks like the, 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 what it would sort of look like from above. Um, but what they try to do, yeah, I'm kind of uh, simplifying this a little bit too much, but what they try to do is they actually register the images so that for each image, um, they're actually geocoded. So you know that this image corresponds to this rectangle, rectangle on Earth. And so they try to take the image and figure out where it is on the Earth. And they can either match with previous images they have, or there's actually marking points on the Earth that they can align with. Um, it's pretty interesting if, you, if you're familiar with like, you know, camera calibration techniques, that there's a lot of patterns. Uh, like people build these really large like white squares or different patterns that satellites can see from space that allow you to calibrate the camera and allow you to understand these are control points. That these are areas that we know the exact latitude and longitude of Earth, and that helps them align the imagery. Um, luckily for us, a little bit to some degree is that a lot of that is handled for us, so we're just getting more of the image in the exact location. Although that being said, a lot of times the images still shift around a little bit because their process that the providers give aren't necessarily perfect. Good question. Yeah. question for like, you know, Earth what kind of deep learning framework do you think primarily TensorFlow and what cloud in, do you run it on the Amazon and those kind of clouds or is it all native? Yeah, good question. Uh, so deep learning frameworks, um, historically when I joined, uh, as mentioned, I was from Amazon and we uh, I learned in CAFE. So I continued to use that back in 2015, uh, which was probably one of the most popular choices at that point. Um, but then frameworks like Keras and TensorFlow came out and so we mostly switched to those at, that, at this point. Um, and it's, yeah, at this point, we try, to person, we try to personally write our code in like a wrapper sense. Uh, uh, you only need a certain amount of glue code for the different frameworks. So if there does ever happen to be another framework either that we want to integrate, like PyTorch, or something new down the line, then we can just create a few uh, wrappers to interface with us. And then for cloud, uh, yeah, we're mostly in AWS at this point. Um, the reason for that actually is a lot of the satellite providers themselves are in AWS Cloud. So there's AWS and S3 or something. Yeah, or, yeah, shared buckets or they put it on cloud. Yeah. Question? Yes. So uh, just curious. So insurance is like one use case. So what what are other use cases if you can talk about a few? Yeah, sure. Uh, I mentioned that one of the first use cases that our company had was um, financial customers. So a lot of hedge funds. So one of our main products was counting cars and parking lots at different retail chains, and then looking at the aggregate across the US. So if we know where all the targets and Walmarts and Starbucks are, can we figure out a trend of how people are shopping at those stores? And so financial customers wanted that data. Um, but then you can also take that car counter and you can look at other trends of how are these cities growing over time just by counting the cars, like if you see neighborhoods pop up. And so that could be useful to um, either local governments or larger governments that just aren't necessarily looking for a direct answer, but just want to understand trends. Um, yeah, insurance is one. Um, the, the, the people, the, the different uh, stores that I just talked about themselves, like they may want that data for competitive advantage, uh, nonprofits. Um, yeah, so that, I guess that answers a little bit into it. But, but I think the good thing is that, uh, or for us as a company, is that the analytics that we're deriving is more or less like the same piece of information, maybe just delivered in a slightly different way for our different customers. Okay. 